Okay, everyone, it is time for another Marilyn Manson update video. The last time I did one of these, I think, was back in December, and I did decide to take a break for a while after that just because I've been covering the case for now in March, a year, just every four weeks, six weeks, always new updates. I just needed to take a break focus on other things and then come back to this and there has been a lot that's been going on especially in the past I would say month or so there has been a two-part documentary that's come out there's been updates to lawsuits there's been defamation cases filed there's been tv interviews and all kinds of news articles and so so many things to go over. I'm probably not going to get to all of it today, but I am going to focus on what I think are the most important parts that have happened since I last talked about the Marilyn Manson accusations back in December. So let's go ahead and get into it. The first thing that I want to talk about is the two-part documentary I mentioned. That is called Phoenix Rising. And it originally was screened for the Sundance Film Festival, though only for the first part. I did watch it when it was for the Sundance Film Festival, and I wanted to wait to see both parts because I didn't originally realize it was only one part, and I was like, what do you mean? It's only half. It is uh, basically an hour and a half for both pieces, and I know because it is behind a paywall, it is available on HBO. Now, it was re released earlier this month. I did want to give a summary of what is said in both parts of the documentary, what it is focusing on, any new pieces of information that we haven't learned about previously, and how it all kind of ties together and forms a story. So basically with the first part of the Phoenix Rising documentary, that really focuses on establishing Evan Rachel Wood, her background, her upbringing, also talking about the beginning of her relationship with Marilyn Manson, and then the decision and process of testifying for the Phoenix Act and how that kind of all went through the legal system. Now at the beginning it talks about, and I didn't really know any of this, for the record, <laughs> in case anyone's wondering, I would not consider myself a fan of Evan Rachel Wood. I'm not saying that she is a bad actress, I just don't really watch any of the things that she's in. So I didn't know any of this going into the documentary at all. But apparently she grew up in a family of actors, mostly theater stage actors. And unfortunately her home life wasn't really the greatest. She did have support in terms of acting from her parents, but they fought a lot, they didn't really get along, and ultimately they did end up separating. And she went with her mom and her dad and her brother stayed behind and they were in, I think it was either North or South Carolina and then her and her mom left when they did end up separating. And there's one really big moment in an early part of the documentary where when she's talking about her upbringing, there's a part that both her mom and herself, and they're interviewed separately as well, they both reference this in their conversations about how their family life was, and they both say there was a time when, you know, mom and dad were fighting and they basically said afterwards her dad went and talked to her and said, we fight because we love each other. And I think there's a romantic notion that some people have that like when you really love someone, you fight for, you work really hard, and sometimes you yell and you scream and like, I get where the mentality comes from. It's like, oh, if you don't, if you're not willing to fight, then you don't really care. But what the theory is, or I think what this film is trying to say is that this sort of implanted in Evan Rachel from a young age that fighting was normalized, fighting was part of being in love, and because of how disruptive her upbringing was, that maybe put her in a position where she was less able to detect 
what Marilyn Manson was doing was wrong earlier on in the relationship and kind of set her up on maybe a, a bad path. And I feel really bad, especially for her mom, because she is, gets really emotional about this and is like, oh my God, I can't believe that this is what I'm showing my daughter. She cannot be around this anymore. And it's after this fight and this conversation that they do decide to leave. So she grows up in a family of actors and basically when she lives with her mom, that is when she starts to be able to take her own acting career more seriously, it seems like. And she was actually able to find old diaries that she had apparently that she thought she had lost where she actually talks about this period of growing up and becoming an adult and, and getting more independence and starting her career. And in those diaries, she documents the first time that she met Marilyn Manson. She went to a party at somewhere called Chateau Mormont, which I'm probably <laughs> terribly mispronouncing. And she was 18 and he was 37. And the way that she describes how he supposedly introduced himself is just, I, I realize why him and Neil Strauss worked together on his uh, autobiography. And I can only describe it as something from a pickup artist manual. He goes by in a gold suit and right as he's going past, he turns back and says, don't fall. <laughs> and I just like, I don't know if that's true or not, but the mental image is just like, it's so perfect. And she apparently thought that he was like a Marilyn Manson poser from far away. And then after he actually said something with her friends, she was like, that's like actually Marilyn Manson though. What just happened? So they ended up striking up a conversation. They started talking and right away they had this connection because he recognized Evan Rachel from her work in a film called 13. And this kind of struck me because it reminded me of how he actually met Rose McGowan. Rose McGowan was an actress and she met Marilyn Manson in, and this is mentioned in like an old article in an interview he did in the 90s. They met at a film premiere for a film called Gummo and they started a conversation over that. So I think it seems like from a lot of his past relationships, art, music, especially film, seems to be something that there is a lot of connection around because both Evan Rachel Wood and some of the other women that he's been in relationships with talk about how he loves having these conversations about art and music and philosophy and film and like that's really engrossing and especially when you are a young actress like Evan Rachel Wood who's trying to kind of get started really in her adult career like being able to find someone that you have that professional connection with that really gets you and wants to have those conversations I imagine is really fulfilling and that is really how she sees the start of their relationship because she did have a boyfriend at the time and they were really connecting over career stuff essentially is how she saw it and like Esme Bianco a couple years later part of the premise for the beginning of their relationship and her coming over to his house was to work on a film that is based on Lewis Carroll called Phantasmagoria and that never ended up getting made but she would come over and they would work together on the film work on the script and he did ask her for her help apparently and they would just go over he would facilitate underage drinking by giving her absinthe and they would do that and they would talk and be close and work on this thing together and she really saw it as you know a friendly relationship definitely they had a connection in terms of she grew up very sheltered she grew up homeschooled she was not really taught a lot about sex and she describes that she didn't really have a core personality and she was trying to find herself. And so Marilyn Manson comes in and he really seems like this very well-read, astute guy that knows the things that she's into and is encouraging her and seems like he can be this guy that can help her discover herself on a personal level as well as on a professional level. And we'll obviously see how that turns out a little bit later on. but. Their relationship did take a turn during one of the last times they hung out together to work on this film. So she was about to leave to go work on a different film project. And as they are saying goodbye, he supposedly just starts kissing her like full tongue in the mouth type situation. And she is totally 
just taken aback by that because she has kissed professionally for movies she has a teenage boyfriend that's around her age that she was with but to suddenly just have this grown adult man who is almost twice her age or even actually 18 plus 18 yeah twice her age <laughs> uh you know that really took her aback and that especially because he was still married to Dita Von Teese at the time just really changed things after that point in terms of the relationship and where things ended up going and the way that she describes her relationship with Marilyn Manson is she compares it to being like a frog in a pot you guys have probably heard this saying before and the idea is if you put a frog in a boiling pot of water it will simply jump out it'll be like whoa too hot getting out of here goodbye but if you put a frog in a pot of water and you slowly turn up the heat and you slowly start to boil it won't know to leave until it's already too late and that is certainly something that seems to have happened here because when you slowly go from friendly professional relationship to romantic relationship to maybe not super healthy romantic relationship it gets much harder to know how to leave especially because she describes that when they start getting closer he immediately is trying to start like severing ties to her family she's already pretty estranged from her dad her brother is far away and her mom is really the close one to her and he's basically like hey like she's probably holding you back you need to look into your finances and you shouldn't really trust her and I don't know what happened with the details there apparently something with her finances not being managed well potentially happened and that kind of solidified Manson as being right and being the one who could be trusted and her family were not people who could be trusted which is really starting that process of isolation and then from there it just ramps up and it leads to sharing blood and making blood packs and branding and scarring as a way to show loyalty and I imagine that you know putting myself in my shoes of you know having once been an edgy teenager I mean you don't you don't wear blue eyeshadow and purple lipstick without <laughs> having some kind of background that being said though being in that edgy teenager mentality having her first real experience dating like a fully adult man like that can seem like oh my god our relationship is so real and so intense and we're doing all these things and that really means that we're in a super intense relationship and this is a good and positive and normal thing and other people maybe don't understand it but like it's just because of like how intense we are together and how really in love we are and how really close our relationship is and something that's worth mentioning here is there is a photo on screen that's shown of a bloody m that's like a really zoomed in photo so it's really hard to tell where it is but it's a, a bloody m that has been cut out that we see on screen and then in the second part of the documentary you see on evan rachel wood very clearly a scar of the letter m and i am sure there are people out there that are like scar truthers that are like that's photoshop that is she did that to herself to make him look like he did it she did it because she wanted it blah, 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 whatever that to me as someone that has scars that are not that old but have been around for several years the color of the scar and the healing of it makes it seem like it is certainly an older scar not something she did because they're like oh i'm gonna do this documentary i better proactively scar myself so i could blame someone else for it like it looks like it's probably a legitimate scar and we have seen in other testimonies especially from ashley morgan smithline she did a whole photo shoot with i think it was people magazine where she also had a scar that looks like an m that's in a similar place on the body and that is just a very strangely particular detail in my mind at least and yeah but going back into the timeline of the documentary this is when we get to the very infamous heart-shaped glasses 
music video. And it used to be very infamous because it was like, ooh, did they really have sex on set? Is that what really happened? Nobody assumed that what was happening, I think anyways, could be non-consensual. It was always the rumor that like this was a thing that broke up the marriage between Dita Von Teese and Marilyn Manson because it was like really strong evidence of them cheating. I think even was it the bed in that music video that was like their actual like marital bed? Like that may have been a different music video. That may have been, I'm maybe crossing wires here, but there may have been something about that going on as well. And um, unfortunately, from what it seems, from what Evan Rachel is saying now, that is maybe a darker situation than people were at least talking about very openly. And she was 19 at the time the music video was filmed. No one wanted her to do it in her family. Everyone was like, this is a terrible, bad idea. She didn't listen because, you know, 19, boyfriend, of course. If your boyfriend's like, hey, let's do a music video together, it's gonna be super hot and edgy and cool. Like, like, come on. Like, I think a lot of people are gonna be like, yeah, I wanna be in the music video. So she was 19. And they had done a lot of work beforehand, kind of talking about, hey, we're going to do a simulated sex scene. It's going to be this whole thing. There's going to be fake blood. It's going to be a whole production. And she agreed to do that. But then when they were actually on set, first of all, she was given alcohol. She was also given drugs, allegedly. She was out of it. And when they were actually filming the sex scenes, he then decided to penetrate her for real and being under the influence of possibly numerous substances, that is not a condition under which somebody can consent. I don't care if the person is even in an established relationship, unless you have had explicitly the conversation that, hey, when I'm drunk tonight, I'm okay with you having sex with me. Like that's not good consent practice in my mind. And besides that as well, it was apparently a really unprofessional set. It was just complete, chaos. Manson was not paying attention to the timeline, the schedule, the scripts. It was just whatever he wanted it to be. And it was just not, not a good time. And uh, it definitely had some fallout to it. This is hard for me to talk about. The music video. She was 19. You know, um, we, you know, I didn't want her to do it. Nobody wanted her to do it. But I think she felt like it was like true romance. It was cool and it was edgy and she really liked it and she really wanted to do it. My ex-husband was on a shoot the next day and somebody on the shoot said to him, oh my God, I was on the weirdest shoot last night. And it was the video. And he told him that the girl was out of it, that he was giving her absinthe and whatever else, and he was having her do things that are not in the script, that are not part of the schedule. They're just things that he decides he wants to do when she cannot consent. Later in part two of the documentary, there is a segment where they mention that there are potentially some crew members from the Heart Shaped Glasses documentary that may be willing to testify that what they saw was not okay and that she may have been underage and intoxicated. And as well, after this documentary came out, there was a piece done by Rolling Stone that also covers this in more detail, including some direct quotes from, I think, potentially same crew members as what is mentioned in the documentary, but some crew members at least willing to share their opinion of what happened during that day on set. One crew member who was on set for the whole video shoot backed up Wood's claim when reached by Rolling Stone. I do believe that there were some moments of actual intercourse, the source, who asked to remain anonymous fearing retribution, tells Rolling Stone. The crew was very uncomfortable, the source says, after a take or two. The shoot was shut down over the sex scenes as arguments between Manson and producers and crew members escalated. Everyone understood what kind of artist we were dealing with, but we're not here to shoot an adult film, he says. I've never encountered anything like that before or since in my career. It's never real, ever. That's something that only happens in the adult film industry. The source adds that Wood seemed off and numbish, but was overall very delightful. It was a pretty intimate scene with the two of them and they were connecting. 
says another crew member who was not aware if the intercourse was real or not. And so everyone in the cast and crew was all alienated. So that's why it became somewhat uncomfortable for all of us around. But even as the documentary is primarily covering the alleged abuse that Marilyn Manson inflicted, there is still room for empathy for him, for sympathy for him as Marilyn Manson, as Brian Warner, sharing his upbringing and his troubled family life and his mother's maybe supposed struggle with mental illness and being bullied in school, him feeling really isolated and dejected and wanting to shut other people out to reduce his own vulnerability and I think it's good that they included that of course none of that excuses anyone's behavior especially when they do it as an adult and inflict pain on others but it is important I think to have that context and have that understanding and also during the documentary Evan does say you know this isn't a project for destroying Marilyn Manson that's not what they are trying to do and I think that's important I think a lot of people have the assumption this is like all some kind of elaborate character assassination and you know uh, I don't get that impression but of course other people are going to interpret things differently now that is really where part one ends there's a couple other just bits and pieces around that I'm not really sure how to tie into the whole story but I think are important to cover so one is that there's a scene where he's he's cutting a birthday cake with a like a hatchet like a like a hand axe or something and it's kind of funny except for the part where he says that they're really bad for cutting cake but great for cutting women with which is doubly creepy when you recall that many of the allegations against him do involve stories of him threatening or wanting to or actually assaulting people with hatchets and baseball bats and things of that nature so that just came across as pretty creepy uh, there is also a couple second clip of the groupie tape that is shown as well and we'll be talking about the groupie tape later on in this video as well for the record and there is a polaroid photo uh, that seems to be of Evan Rachel Wood, though it is just of the torso, really not her head, so I don't really know for sure. But there is a picture of someone's, probably Evan's torso, with a big old welt on it. And not only is that a weird photo in general, but to clarify something, because Fifty Shades of Grey has made people believe that things like flogging and caning on, on the stomach are sensual and fun and erotic, no, uh, generally any kind of impact play on the stomach is not recommended. The organs are real squishy, real sensitive. That's not generally a fun experience. There are people that are really into like stomach punching, for example, but like that looks like something left a welt, like an instrument left a welt. And it's just a strange photo when I don't know what to make of it, but yeah it's it's out there so moving on to part two this section is much more focused on the survivors as a group rather than just being about establishing evan rachel wood and marilyn manson's like relationship history and it actually starts out saying that the spark that started the wheels turning for naming Marilyn Manson publicly happened because Dan Cleary, who was one of Manson's former assistants, talked about him on Twitter in 2020. And he was one of the first people from Manson's camp that was willing to speak out publicly against him by name and say, hey, I know Evan Rachel Wood hasn't named him directly, but I was there I saw it, I heard her testimony, and I saw Marilyn Manson do fucked up things to her, and I saw her change into a different person because of the time that she was around Marilyn Manson. And that really just caused a deluge of people either contacting her or connecting the dots and more potential survivors, more potential victims and exes of Manson getting in touch and then deciding, hey, like, if we work together, we don't have to do this alone and we're not alone. 
and maybe it makes sense to actually name him publicly as a group with that group support. And I know that later on, especially when we talk about the defamation case, there's very much this characterization that it's all this big coordinated group effort of basically jealous Scott Pilgrim uh, esque exes, I guess, where they all really want revenge on Marilyn Manson for some reason, or want his money, or want fame, or whatever. But when you are dealing with being isolated by someone for a long time, and you kind of pre-work in these stories that, oh, my ex was crazy, my ex was crazy, it makes it really hard to connect that this happened to other people because there's that pre-built-in story that, oh, my exes are crazy, my exes are crazy, she was the worst, I hated her, she actually abused me. Like, you build in these stories, it makes it hard for people to connect and makes it feel like their experience must be an isolated incident. And when you are potentially thinking of bringing charges against someone that is a world famous star, that's that's going to bring some hesitation. There is strength in numbers. And when you find out that you aren't alone and that many people have gone through the same thing, it strengthens your case to do it together as a group as opposed to, you know, being willing to do it alone and take the brunt of all of that criticism because certainly going online, accusing anyone that's famous of something, you are always going to get the people that are diehard fans, that have a very, very strong opinion about this stuff, say, she's crazy, Marilyn Manson should sue her for defamation, she's lying, she wants his money, she wants fame, she wants this, she wants that. And again, just doing it as a group I think is easier. But getting more back into what they were talking about in the documentary, basically they're all together at what I think is Evan Rachel Wood's house as a group, and they're talking about their experiences. And one of the first things that gets said is Dan Cleary brings up Manson's interest in hacking. And that quote, anyone who hopped onto his Wi-Fi, he had your information and was able to, I think, clone phones or clone laptops or something. And this is something that has been brought up many, many, many times before. Manson is very much into this kind of thing. He is into spy games doesn't entirely seem out of the question that he would be monitoring people, that he would be getting passwords in that. And especially if this is true and he is like hacking phones, hacking social media, watching email, doing all of that stuff, it makes it very, very hard to reach out. Even when you do have friends and family on Facebook and you text them every day, like you can't necessarily say with confidence that something is wrong because there's that fear that someone is watching you and that they will find out and that that would actually be more unsafe for you if you said something versus not saying anything at all. And speaking of that, uh, there is a really disturbing clip that gets shared as well of what I believe is a home recording, maybe from a cell phone. In it, Marilyn Manson is heard to directly threaten to kill Evan Rachel Wood because of what seems to be a very simple miscommunication. Now, of course, we don't have the full context for it. We probably don't have the full video. Who knows what was happening before that? But that is just disturbing to hear, if nothing else, context being removed if there is larger context there. Now, one of the big questions that a lot of people have when they're looking into the accusations against Marilyn Manson is, why did he start suddenly becoming abusive with Evan Rachel Wood? What about Rose McGowan? What about Dee Devontees? And I have talked about this in other videos, but it's been a really long time, so I will just mention it briefly here. With Rose McGowan, she has come out in support of those that are accusers of Marilyn Manson. She says nothing ever happened to her in that relationship, but that she does still believe and support them. With Dita Von Tees, it's a little bit less clear. She's never said anything publicly. The one statement she made at the time was deleted and she's always been very mum about the ending of that relationship. And the few times earlier on after the ending of the relationship that she did talk about it, there were certainly hints towards things being unhealthy in the relationship uh, that there was just problems there, maybe not outright full-blown abuse, but certainly things that contributed to the end of the relationship. And my theory has always been, especially with the way that he seems to have pushed Evan Rachel towards, 
that something around the ending of the relationship with Dita Von Tees just just broke him somehow like I don't know what it was I, I don't know I don't really have any like I'm not I'm not a psychologist I'm not his psychologist I don't know but it seems like that's really the start of the timeline you have to remember like not everyone who is an abuser starts abusing from like age 10 they're always awful to everyone ever like they kind of get the sense of like who is someone they can act a certain way towards and certainly with Dita Von Tees and Rose McGowan like they were much more established they in terms of age were much closer there was less of a power differential there as well which I think is important to consider and especially with his very openly easily documented history of drug and alcohol use I think that could certainly steer someone towards a direction of having more violent relationships even if they didn't always have relationships that were that way so what evan rachel says really made a difference in terms of their relationship going in a darker direction was actually twiggy ramirez rejoining the band and when he rejoined it was like all of the antics went right up to 11. they were at like a 10 and a half now they're at 11 they're at a 12 right the stage shows got even more off the wall and the way that they behaved behind the scenes got way more intense as well and that reflected in their relationship and evan's theory for why this is the case why things suddenly escalated even more was because with twiggy rejoining it was almost like he still had to prove himself to be a hard man he still had to prove and i'm not i'm not a sissy who's in love and cares about someone gross uh, I am a crazy rocker who's gonna do super out there antics and I'm gonna party with the boys and like that's kind of maybe what pushes them towards that direction even going to the point of actually recruiting the crew members into participating in the abuse and in the just general intimidation tactics. I'd be in the room with him and Lindsay and he would make me record the things he would say to her, oh, yeah. videotape the things he would say to her, mm -hmm. and he would tell her like, I'm going to kill you, I'm gonna chop you up, and Dan is gonna bury you in the desert. Yeah. He's gonna do all this, he's gonna put you in the trunk and bury all your parts in the desert. And he would leave the room, and I would go and put my hand on her back and be like, I'm not gonna kill you. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is also really when allegedly the blackmail started to kick into high gear. Many of the accusers describe basically a trio of things they would typically go after. They would have you say the n-word on camera, they would have you do drugs, and they would get nude photos or video. And that, that was supposed to ensure compliance and silence and basically like hey you're part of us now you you this is part of what we do and particularly with the anti-semitic things that they would do they would say oh well, it's just this is ironic nazi stuff this is to make fun of hitler this is to make fun of the nazis we're just doing it because it's edgy ironic humor which we've heard a little bit of that on the internet recently but not getting into that too much they would escalate from it just being you know this is ironic racism this is ironic nazis to make fun of their stupid beliefs that would escalate into being obligatory that you would participate in doing that stuff and if you didn't it meant that you couldn't be trusted anymore and your position in the group and your safety was potentially going to be threatened as a result and what originally started as facilitating underage drinking when Evan Rachel Wood was 18 and 19 that eventually escalated into full-blown drug use and allegedly cultivating an addiction getting to the point that Manson refused to help Evan Rachel Wood become clean she said I don't know how this happened I'm an addict I don't want to be an addict I want to get clean please help me do this and he refused to not keep drugs around not keep booze around he would leave drugs out just like he would normally do even supposedly cutting her coke with meth and then also drugging her so that way he could have his way with her body while she was asleep and that was when things got really really bad and all of this culminates in a visit between Evan Rachel and her brother 
and they're outside and they're they're walking outside Manson's house and she stumbles and falls and hurts herself outside and Manson is with someone and they walk by really coldly and they're like we're going to Home Depot see you later doesn't react doesn't say anything doesn't try to help and this really sets off alarm bells because as her brother he's always been the closest to her the parents are really kind of cut out but he's managed to stay close and she has sworn him to secrecy to never say anything to their family because she doesn't want to make things worse basically but with this he's like okay this is like basically a life or death scenario i think at this point for her own good i have to break that promise i made to save my sister and this is where like when i watch when i watch this uh, documentary I didn't think I was gonna get emotional talking about this filming it um but this is where in the documentary that I just started bawling like I started crying like so much listening to this because not even because it's like scary but because of the like love that her brother has towards her to to like be willing to help in that scenario and know when it's gone too far and I just think that's really, really touching. And what ends up happening is uh, he calls their dad. The dad is far away. He can't, he can't get there. And basically he says, like, hey, um, like, Evan needs to leave. She needs to get out. Like, can we help her? And so the dad ends up calling his sister, who's more in the area. And the aunt comes with a gun and just, while Marilyn Manson's out of the house, just moves her out. And, you know, I mean... As far as it comes to leaving potential abusers, alleged abusers, like, that's really the way you have to do it, is quickly, quietly, when they're gone, that is going to be the least, uh, you know, risky scenario to be in. And unfortunately, you know, I wish I could say that's where the story ends and Evan Rachel gets to go and, and lead her life, but it gets a little bit worse first. She does leave, she does get a chance to you know be apart from him but Marilyn Manson uh, as is well documented in many newspapers after this uh, does not take her leaving very well and he calls her incessantly he cuts himself over a hundred times in protest basically until Evan Rachel agrees to go back and be with him again and so she re-enters being in Manson's life because you know she cares about him. She doesn't want him to die, so she goes back. And like we, we uh, there's things that happen as a result. I'm not going to talk about it too much because uh, I've covered the things involving the Violet Wand and all that before in other videos. What is new in this documentary that's not talked about in any of the lawsuits, any other allegations, interviews, anywhere that I can find, what ends up happening after she comes back is that she finds out that she's pregnant with his child because Marilyn Manson apparently does not like using condoms, had a problem with every type of birth control that she tried to use, didn't want her on anything basically. She tried to use other methods like spermicide in order to prevent pregnancy, but that didn't end up working. And so she found out she was pregnant. She got an abortion and Allegedly, after she came back from the procedure, Manson ordered her to make him dinner. Like she had gone to a fucking eye exam and nothing was actually wrong and get back in the kitchen, bitch. That's your job. <laughs> like, huh, if that story is true, oh my god, what? Like, I know we have very limited understanding in general in this country of reproductive health care, but an abortion is an experience that you are meant to rest during. It is hard on your body. You are not supposed to be doing work around the kitchen or on the house. Like, I just feel like that that should be said. You need aftercare after you've gone through a procedure like that, for sure. And I'll just mention this briefly uh, because it's important to the story, but because of uh, this experience, uh, at least in part at least, this leads Evan Rachel to become suicidal and she does attempt to take her life. 
and she lives, of course, uh, and that is really what she describes, and the reason for the name behind this is that is when she describes the phoenix rising again as after that experience and being able to come back from it, very, very fortunately, of course. And the documentary ends on the note that apparently prior to Manson being named publicly sometime around October, November of 2020, there is apparently uh, an already existing uh, investigation of Marilyn Manson by the FBI and she's waiting on a phone call to be interviewed by them. She gets that phone call. She goes to the FBI. She gets interviewed by them. They, they go, film her going into the building. And that is really the first time she feels like she's able to tell her whole story and that she's really heard and that it's by Marilyn Manson's name. And we haven't really heard a lot from the FBI, like anything ever, as far as you know, public acknowledgement of an investigation of Marilyn Manson, which I think is really interesting uh, because the LASD by comparison has been open about the fact there is an investigation. They are looking into things. FBI will say nothing. So what will result or did result from that interview, from that process, we don't know yet at this point and we may not ever know. Nothing could end up happening with that, but it might end up being something. And it just is interesting to connect the timeline to the fact that that investigation was happening prior to him being named publicly, at least if the timelines are connecting together the way I think they're connecting together. Now, of course, with such a big documentary coming out and it being at the Sundance Film Festival, there are going to be articles about this. There are going to be interviews. Outlets want to know the details behind this. So there was an interview that was done with the Daily Beast where they interviewed the director, Amy Berg, who is, I think, most well known for her previous documentaries looking at abuse in Hollywood and in the Catholic Church. So she kind of has a niche a little bit when it comes to the types of documentaries she tends to make. And I think it is good to have the background of the process of making Phoenix Rising. So here's what they had to say in that article. Yes, it was almost a three-year process. Evan approached me right after she did the Survivor Bill of Rights testimony. She was in the process of building the Phoenix Act and working on changing the statute of limitations in California, so that was what we were initially going to be documenting, a woman challenging the system after her own statute of limitations had expired. For the first year, all we were doing was documenting her movements in that realm. What happened next was Manson's former tour mate, Dan Cleary tweeted in support of Evan Rachel Wood, and suddenly the floodgates opened, and other survivors started reaching out. That's when we decided to open it up, to get into the Brian Warner story, her past, and other survivors. And also, the way that Evan described it is that Brian is very good at getting that photo with famous people whenever he's at an event, which gives him this public credibility that may or may not be accurate. If you were to Google him with other celebrities and check in with their reps, I'm sure you'd find out that he's not as close to a lot of those people. In our research, I spoke to many people who had seen things at his house, but didn't like that they were recorded there, so didn't speak up. There are a lot of stories out there. Now, I don't really have a lot to add about that last little tidbit, other than it is very interesting that maybe some of Manson's celebrity friendships are not as close as they maybe have appeared to be. Now, Besides the documentary, there have been a lot of other things happening in the month of March when it comes to Marilyn Manson and the really, really big one I think a lot of people have been waiting on me to cover is the 28 page defamation lawsuit that he filed against Evan Rachel Wood and Ilma Gore who worked with her on the documentary. And the timing of this was a little bit interesting. It did come out at the beginning of March, a couple of weeks and even two full weeks, I think, before the release of Phoenix Rising on HBO. The lawsuit includes complaints of defamation per se, as well as intentional infliction of emotional distress, as well as, quote, claiming that Wood and Gore impersonated an FBI agent by forging and distributing a fictitious letter from the agent to create the false appearance that Warner's alleged victims and their families were in danger, and that there was a federal criminal investigation of Warner ongoing. 
It also alleges that Wood and Gore provided checklists and scripts to accusers and made knowingly false statements, including that Manson, quote, filmed the sexual assault of a minor. The lawsuit paints the picture that Evan Rachel Wood never named and never would have named Marilyn Manson as an abuser until she met Ilma Gore, who is painted as being a grifter with a past of identity theft that is really just in it for herself and is looking to profit off of action taken against Marilyn Manson. And they met in 2016 over the years, they became romantically involved in 2019, and then they hatched a plan to be able to accuse him and be able to profit off of it. And they would recruit people that were victims by sending them things over text or through direct messages like this. Hey, I know this is a strange way to reach out, but my name is Ilma. I work with the Phoenix Act. I run it alongside Evan Rachel Wood. We were organizing a group of people to meet up in Los Angeles and Zoom slash Skype in to talk about experience they had that might be similar to yours. I'm not sure that you would be interested in participating. You aren't obligated to speak, but if you wanted to listen in, that would be fine. It's a small group and you are personally invited. If you wanted to know more first, I would be happy to jump on the phone or email more details. Best, Ilma. The allegation being that this falsely lured in recruits with the promise of being able to meet with a famous actress and be associated with her. And they were supposedly given a 21 page checklist of fabricated acts of abuse to ensure their public claims against Warner and create the fake perception of a pattern of wrongful conduct. They do provide a copy of this supposed checklist as an attachment to this lawsuit, though it is redacted. And looking at it to me, it doesn't really come across like a smoking gun of like, ha, ah, this proves they were all coordinating. It's all lies. To me, it seems like an intake form, like it's name, date, relationship with Manson. Here's some stuff that maybe he did to you. Some notes at the bottom. Like it's, it's, pretty bare bones in terms of a format and structure and to me it reads like it could more be about trying to establish if there was a pattern instead of coaching people hey this is what you need to say because I feel like if they were doing that they would just send a list of like hey here's the bullet points you have to hit when you make a statement against him this is what we want you to say as opposed to giving them a checklist they can fill out on their own. I don't know. The thing that's really interesting to me though that I'm not sure what to make of is the copy they have, though it is redacted, they did not redact the part where it gives the relationship of the person to Marilyn Manson and it does have the spouse box checked off, which is, you know, Marilyn Manson, He's had a lot of lovers, but he's only been married twice, and he was married to Dita Von Teese, obviously, and he more recently was married to Lindsay Ush, uh, Usich, not sure how to pronounce that one again, couldn't find how to do it online, correct me below if you want to. And in any case, uh, they only got married, I think, actually in 2020, so... You know, there's not really any direct evidence in this whole lawsuit of where that came from. Like, it is redacted, so we can't say who it's from, obviously. It could be that, like, he typed it up in Microsoft Word and printed it out and then filled it out for shits and giggles and then put it in evidence. Like, who knows, right? It's going to be something that will have to be analyzed for sure, what the origin of that document was, because, of course, you know, just because it's a attachment in a lawsuit that hasn't been responded to yet either we don't really know the source of it like it doesn't say like you know here's how it was accessed it came over an email from this email address and this is where it's a google doc and, you know it just like here's the attachment you know so it's not really like larger context about where that's from but i think just having a checklist of like hey do we all have similar experiences if so what do those look like doesn't really seem like super strong evidence of like 
they were planning all along to do a coordinated attack when I think you can also easily look at that and describe it as like, oh, you're trying to see what the similar experiences might look like and how common certain types of abuse may have been. In any case, from there, the lawsuit moves on to saying that Gore allegedly edited the scripts of recruits, instructed them to embellish or add to or lie or hyperbolize or just make up stories about abuse or their experiences with Manson, basically coaching them to say that they were trafficked by Manson, that they were too scared to speak out, that he assaulted them even if he didn't really do that, and things of that nature. That basically she was the architect of everyone's Instagram posts, more or less. I think that's sort of what this is getting to, because that was definitely a theory that was passed around in certain circles when this came out is that, oh, there was one person who wrote all of the Instagram stories, that wrote all of the allegations. I personally don't see that as all being written by one person. They definitely all have their own style and way of phrasing things. They certainly are similar that they are all accusations that have some similar points to them, but I don't think it goes so far as to, like, being written entirely by one person. And again, the evidence that they use to support this claim is they have an attachment of a handwritten document, like a picture of a handwritten document that is incredibly hard to read. So I hope they have a better copy for the actual proceeding to look over because it, it, it looks like chicken scratch of someone trying to work out what it is they wanna say. And I do want to add that when you have gone through abuse, your recall of things can be fragmented. It can be hard to put together a timeline clearly of what happened or know what to say. And if you are preparing to interact with the media about something that can be a very emotional taxing experience, like you wanna have your ducks in a row. You want to know what it is that you're gonna say ahead of time. So it's not out of line that someone that is a potential victim of abuse would be like, here's my thoughts, here's kind of what I want to say. And it's not even really clear to me from the photo, like what's the original and what is all of the edits and they all kind of like blur together a little bit because again, it's really hard to read. So I can't really say just looking at that if it's like, oh, they totally added in a complete lie here because I can't even fucking read what's on the paper really. Maybe my eyes are just bad, I don't know. But it's hard to say definitively what it is just from that one attachment. I also would say though, again, giving benefit of the doubt here, give, giving a different interpretation is that when you are somebody that is a victim of abuse and you are trying to describe it, it can be helpful to have someone that is a third party to that scenario come in and help you like know how to phrase things, how to talk about things. And especially when you are maybe navigating legal claims towards someone, knowing how to phrase that might be important. But I don't know, again, I don't really think that's a complete smoking gun. It's something that I think is worth being, you know, skeptical of, but I don't think it's like, this is this one photo of like a handwritten single page of something is proof that Ilma Gore personally edited every single accusation and told everyone to lie. Like, I don't know, again, I don't think the evidence fully supports the claims there, but moving on, I think probably what is, the most serious claim in the lawsuit is the claim that Wood and Gore conspired together to impersonate an FBI agent and create a fake document from that FBI agent. And according to the details in the lawsuit, they say that their team contacted this FBI agent and the FBI agent has no memory of writing this, approving this, being involved in this letter in anyway and so that seems a lot more serious and there is also a text message that gets shown as well of i believe it's alabama and then it says hey like we're working on this thing together how does this fbi letter sound you know and i will say that the text message and the actual printed version that is attached as evidence they don't match up entirely with each other. There are some phrasing differences. And they did say that Alabama was a nickname for Evan Rachel Wood around the time that she was with Manson. And so 
that's interesting. It doesn't show any phone numbers, though. So, like, anyone could change a contact to, say, Alabama, right? And it says, I believe, that the texts are from November, but it doesn't say which November or when the capture, the photo of the conversation was taken. Like, it, it, like it's November, but is it 2019, 2020, 21 like was it like I don't know where it came from I don't know who sent the messages that is all really hard to tell from a photo of a text message again that's going to be something where I think the discovery process of this case is going to be really interesting where the courts are really going to see the details of where these things are coming from because I'm wondering okay if this is private correspondence of Evan Rachel Wood and Ilma Gore how the fuck did Manson's team get their phone or just screen captures from this person's phone in order to be able to use this as evidence in court like did somebody's phone get lost get stolen did a friend get forwarded this and they sent it to Manson? like i don't know that seems weird to me like how like how, how do you have that the allegation is that evan rachel wood and ilma gore worked together to create the document so i don't know who else the other party in the message would be if it's not ilma or evan anyways i think that one is obviously very concerning and that would definitely for example put evan rachel wood's custody case uh in in jeopardy um you know and that's part of why i wanted to wait to cover this until there was a response formally from ilma gore and evan rachel wood because I think that's something that's really worth looking into. And like I've always said in these videos, I really want these cases, when there are legal proceedings, I want them to go to court. I don't want them to be thrown out on a technicality about statute of limitations. I want the court to be able to review the evidence, review the documentation, really be able to look at what's going on and, and really evaluate that in detail because I really think uh, this process deserves uh, that level of review and there's certainly lots of things that there are big question marks around and I know that one of the one of the big things that a lot of detractors will say is that look like, well well Manson showed evidence and none of the other accusers provided the attachments of their evidence or, or anything like that in any of the documents so like obviously by by virtue of the fact he had three attachments in a 28 page lawsuit he is more correct than all of the other accusers and i can see the logic for that i can see why somebody would be skeptical based on not being able to see evidence from a lawsuit <sighs> I understand wanting to keep certain things private and only have that be reviewed by the court. And I get why you would wanna show that ahead of time to prove your innocence. I think it is generally better. I think it is generally more recommended to keep those cards close. And really, you know, that evidence is for the discovery process. It is for the courts. It is for the legal teams. It is not for public consumption and speculation. And I don't think that's really what it should be treated as. Like, it's it's for the legal process, not for the internet to go, oh my god, this, that, and the other thing. You know, because, like, if you're posting all your evidence in, like, a Dropbox folder uh, and linking it from your Instagram account, like, that's just going to get absolutely torn to pieces. And I imagine that, you know, as a victim, you maybe don't want to go through that. You don't want to go through that level of scrutiny. So, you know, again, who knows? There are so many different legal proceedings in process at this point, And who knows how much we would see as the public in terms of evidence. Uh, who knows what to think about the evidence that Marilyn Manson has presented thus far in his defamation case. I personally think the evidence shown thus far does deserve a level of scrutiny but again I do want that to all have its day in court and I do want that to be something uh, that is reviewed and is clarified and I do want there to be the opportunity for Evan Rachel Wood and Emma Gore to respond to that and also what is I think interesting about this especially because the lawsuit was filed before the documentary came out maybe Manson's legal team didn't know this there is an entire scene where Evan Rachel Wood goes into an FBI field office and does an interview. And I mean, I guess if we're really putting a tinfoil hat on here, you could say that, oh, they just 
filmed her walking in and she was there for a totally different reason and they said it was about something else that it it, it wasn't actually related to that at all and it's not actually about Manson at all it was for you know just going on a tour because they felt like it and they just you know or maybe she walked in and walked out and you know it's all fabricated with movie tricks or whatever I personally don't like living with that level of tin foil hat in my life but I am sure that is something that people are going to say now that the documentary is also out especially when the documentary does say that there was already an FBI investigation happening before he got named publicly so again don't know how to square those two things but we will find out through the legal process I assume so speaking of the FBI uh one of the other allegations in the lawsuit was that Ilma Gore swatted Marilyn Manson and this goes along with the intentional infliction of emotional distress claim and how this is framed is basically that this happened on February 3rd the allegations went public on February 1st and Ilma Gore got in touch with the FBI and then the FBI got in touch with the LAPD and they had them go out to Marilyn Manson's house. Uh, to the lawsuit's description, this is because uh, they wanted to either like humiliate and embarrass Manson or create a scene that would be like a media frenzy and would just disrupt and upset Manson and put him in danger's way. Now from what I can tell, this appears to have been a wellness check, not a swatting event. Those are different things. So uh, the LAPD basically uh, was like, hey, there's this friend, Ilma Gore, concerned about Marilyn Manson's safety. Can you get in touch with her? Let her know that Manson's doing okay. Because what had happened is the LAPD showed up. There was a helicopter involved at some point. And this is all originally reported on at the time that this, you know, happened right after the allegations came out. And, uh, you know, nobody was shot at. I don't think the SWAT team was there. Like, like n nothing, like, that would typically happen during a swatting except for maybe the helicopter being involved actually happened. And this is complicated because this involves having empathy for... An alleged abuser and I think that this might be hard for some people to understand but imagine it's been two days after really big allegations have come out it is the talk of the town it's everywhere it's all over the news and we know from Manson's previous actions when Evan Rachel Wood left him that he can react in a way that is detrimental to his health and safety, cutting himself over a hundred times, right? Calling incessantly. And with a history of self-harm, of drug use, of alcohol use, someone in that position could decide to take actions against themselves rather than have to face any sort of allegations, have to go to court, have to go through all of that. And there could have been legitimate concern that Marilyn Manson might kill himself, might harm himself in some way. And if you are legitimately interested in justice, you, you don't want the accused to off themselves before getting to trial. You want to be able to have that legal process happen. You want to be able to have that day of facing each other in court, right? You don't want somebody to just like, again, destroy their life and I, I think that could be part of what's happening here knowing his history of self-harm knowing his history of drug and alcohol use and abuse I think that very much could be something that happened where there was legitimate concern I think the and it's hard to say if Ilma Gore like herself said on the phone like hi I'm Marilyn Manson's friend but the way that the police write about it is that Ilma Gore says she's a friend of Marilyn Manson there is definitely an overstatement I think of their relationship by far there um but maybe that could have been you know a telephone game literally of her calling the FBI the FBI calling the LAPD and then them getting back in touch with you know uh Manson's contact after that at that point so who knows about that? I think based on what happened in public that was very well documented, 
probably just a regular safety check on someone that, you know, potentially could be in harm's way. Not a swatting. Don't think that's really something holds water. I think you could say, again, overstatement of the relationship with Manson, maybe. Or, you know, maybe it was part of a media thing, wanting to get attention, wanting to embarrass him in some way or harm him emotionally in some way, maybe. But again, I think there could be legitimate concern uh, that he might act irrationally. I don't believe that he will stop until he is stopped. And sometimes the greatest act of love is stopping that person from hurting themselves or hurting anybody else. Now, the big final accusation in the lawsuit involves something called the groupie tape, which we have discussed before in some of my other videos. But what they allege is, quote, Gore had multiple conversations with prospective accusers in which he claimed that a 1996 short film made by Warner called Groupie depicted child abuse and child pornography. During one such conversation in 2021, Gore said that the actress was minor at the time of the shoot and was dead and that if the video were ever to be seen, Warner would be indicted. They claimed the actress in the shoot was then 22-year-old Paula Weiss and the supposed director, Joseph Coltis, who directed another 1998 project with Manson, says it was also faked. Now, they don't have any direct evidence that they share for this conversation other than it supposedly happened. And I don't, I, I wasn't party to any of these conversations. I don't know what Gore said or didn't say or how she phrased things. But what I do have is one lawsuit that does in particular talk about the groupie tape. So if we are thinking about, okay, let's say that Gore told people about the tape and this was their impression. What does that then reflect in the lawsuits for how the tape is being described? What it does say is that the girl is a seemingly young teenage fan. Seemingly young, not definitively a minor, just appeared to be. As in, when you're filming something, it can be ambiguous how old someone is because of makeup and hairstyling and clothing and such like. So that lawsuit didn't say that the person involved was definitely a minor. And what it did say is that when being shown the tape, uh, Manson would not say either way to the person who watched it whether or not the person was alive or dead at the end of the film. Because in the lawsuit, the intention of the film is to psychologically harm the other person. And that, based on that, you know, in that allegation, it doesn't matter if it's real or false or not, if one is being led to believe that the person could be a minor and could be dead, and it's not clear, it's very ambiguous, and the one person who would know that information that's there is not correcting that and left that information to be ambiguous, to be unanswered, uh, like... I can see how one would be left potentially with the impression that, oh my gosh, this person could really be dead. This person could really be a minor. It's super, super disturbing. And I don't really have any definitive answer on what is really true or not. Now, the lawsuit that was filed there does also say that while Manson does claim that the person in the film was one of his girlfriends at the time, the person says that the, they didn't look like Paula Weiss, that they looked like someone else. And again, that could be makeup, could be a lot of other things, could just be weird angles, who knows, right? Um, so what I would really like to see is definitely like more information about the groupie tape because that is a big, big source of controversy. Like who directed it? Because he's saying it's Joseph Cultus, but then other places say that he self-directed it. It was it really Polo Weiss? Like, were there scripts? Is there notes from that day? Is there editing? Where's like the master copy? Like, can Joseph and Polo like definitively prove they were there that day and actually filmed and were participants in that experience? Like, I I want to know the details there of what exactly happened and who exactly was involved. And so because, at least so far in this lawsuit, we don't have definitive proof of like how Gore talked about this film to other people, I'm kind of by reference including the Jane Doe lawsuit here because that is the place where it is mentioned. It doesn't say that it's definitively child abuse material. It doesn't definitively say that the person in it is dead, but that they were led to believe that that could be true. 
And that's important to remember because, again, the purpose of the use of the tape allegedly was psychological torture. And leaving that ambiguity, leaving that doubt, and I know this because I practice BDSM and fear play and interrogation play is a big part of what a lot of people do. It's something that I know how to do. Leaving that room for doubt, leaving that room for your mind to come up with its own conclusions is exactly how you lead people down the worst possible scariest interpretation because your brain all on its own with very little prompting can come up with all kinds of wacky scenarios really scary and disturbing scenarios if left with a dearth of information and what is there to see is scary and dangerous potentially and someone with manson's hobby interests may be someone that knows about that and left that room for doubt on purpose and uh, because this particular allegation is in connection with the defamation per se part of the lawsuit. In California, the defamation per se claim requires, quote, that one failed to use reasonable care to determine the truth or falsity of this statement. And let's say theoretically that Ilma Gore was told by this Jane Doe about their experience watching the tape. That would be the source of information that she would have to go off of. And Manson has said publicly that at the time when it was made, his manager said, erase all of this, get rid of it, lock it up. If anyone ever sees this, you will go to jail and your career will be over. It is considered to be a lost piece of media. It is something that fan circles have widely wanted to see a full copy of for some time. It is something of a legend in a way. And so, you know, it's not something that's very easy to ascertain the truth about. And I'm sure like, random stranger, ring ring, hey, do you remember that tape you told Marilyn Manson to get rid of and never talk about in public or ever share with anyone? Yeah, I was just wondering, can you confirm or deny? Is that a minor in that? Or are they alive or dead? I just want to know for my own personal uses. That's probably not a conversation that is likely to have happened. So I think it's really going to be a question of if Ilma Gore did her due diligence with trying to ascertain whether or not those things were false or true, if she said them or not. But if she has a source from someone that directly saw the film, like I think that's a pretty strong case of like, hey, I'm going from this person's interpretation and their experience of the thing that's being talked about. But again, I'm not a legal expert. I'm not an attorney. I'm just doing my best here because none of the legal experts on YouTube are really covering this case for some reason. So I am simply just doing my best to interpret what is being put down into these lawsuits. And as I have said numerous times across all of these videos I've done on the Marilyn Manson allegations. And as I have even said earlier today in this very video, I want these things to have their day in court. I want everything to be reviewed fairly and accurately. I want everything to be evaluated. And honestly, like, like I would probably be happy if it turned out that, you know, these things were all fabricated and false because it would mean that over a dozen women didn't experience life-altering horrific things because of a person they trusted. I don't want that to be true. But if it is, uh, I want there to be that day in court. Actually, you know, because I, I want everything to have its day in court. If that is what the people involved decide is best for them, I want that to be part of the process. I want that to be evaluated. I am not here to simply get, like, revenge on Marilyn Manson for some reason like I, I'm not an ex-fan I'm not somebody that's like invested in Marilyn Manson as a person like none of that is the case I'm not invested in anyone in any of this in any way I just want to from my opinion share what is happening what is going on here and I did want to wait originally to uh, see if there was going to be a response to this because I imagine that with the release of the documentary, Oma and Amy Berg and Evan Rachel Wood, they all had to be prepared for some kind of legal action considering the nature of the documentary. I think that's very, very much going to be expected. As of yet, I'm filming this on March 23rd. There has not been a formal response and I imagine that is going to be forthcoming. When that does come out, I will be doing an update, hopefully, not as long as this one's going to end up being, but I will do an update. I will talk about it because I do think it is going to give some important additional context and information and rebuttal to uh, what is being said so far. And I do want to 
dive down into that. And there were also a lot of other things that I could cover, so many other interviews, so many other stories, case updates, and this is just so, so long. I'm not gonna be able to get into that today, but I will in a future video. And I know this isn't really a fun video, but if you wanna make sure to not miss out on my other future updates, I would like it if you could subscribe, just because I know with the YouTube algorithm and with the nature of this stuff, YouTube really does not like <laughs> alerting people that these videos are are being done so uh, again if you want to make sure to not miss that please do subscribe please do turn on the notification bell it feels really weird to ask for that in a video like this but uh needs must it is youtube and uh, it is easy to not be able to keep up with so so many different things going on all at once and i do want to point out here because i don't think i've said this yet almost all of the allegations in the defamation lawsuit are aimed at Ilma Gore directly and not at Evan Rachel Wood. And most Evan Rachel Wood seems to be an accomplice to Ilma Gore. So keep that in mind when you are listening to this and reading about this. And I will, again, I put all my sources down below. So if you want to read the full lawsuit yourself and get your own opinion, please do. I definitely encourage that. And, uh, you know, just remember there are so many people that have accused Marilyn Manson, people that are not formally associated with Evan Rachel Wood or Ilma Gore, people that have come out and spoken on their own, of their own volition. I think it is important to not discount everything everyone has said simply because one person's character is being called into question. I think skepticism is good. I think we need that to be part of this process in certain ways, but I don't want that to be used as like, well, because Ilma Gore uh, did a wellness check on Marilyn Manson, that means all of these dozen women, all these other people that worked with him, all these other, you know, people that were involved with him, they all lied. Uh, I don't, I don't think that that's really the correct response to that level of information or to that kind of allegation. But uh, you know, like I mentioned, there were a lot of other interviews and things that I didn't get time to cover today. And this has been a really heavy conversation. So I will simply leave you with this clip from the interview that Evan Rachel Wood did with Drew Barrymore on her show, because I do think it is very powerful and I think it speaks to this experience. So I will leave you with that. Take care of yourselves, guys, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. I, I, I am, for the, for the past couple of weeks, been, you know, running around talking about this, promoting the documentary, but last night I did get home and break uh, because I've been running around having to be so strong and clear and concise and, you know, you're sitting there, you've got all this pressure, you're the spokesperson for not, you know, not just this documentary, but for all domestic violence survivors, and you're going, oh God, did I say it right? Did I word it right? What am I gonna get sued for? Like, how is this gonna come back to, to, to hurt me? And then I stopped and thought, I should not be this scared to tell the truth. And, and so the system is working, but not the right system. <laughs> And, and, and we've got to find a balance to, to leave room for, for reform, but also give survivors this cushion that they need, especially when we know so much more about trauma now and how long it takes to process.